Kia ora and welcome. Well, what a week it's been for Rugby League. Seven Manly Sea Eagles players boycotting Thursday night's game against the Roosters. The reasons are complex and controversial. First, this backgrounder from Hikurangi Kimiota Jackson. The idea was to represent diversity and inclusion for all. However, there was a breakdown in communication as no one seemed to have told the players or the coaching staff. I truly hope that the communities, the NRL, our players and our staff who have caused confusion and campaign um, can accept <laughs> our policy. And it cost Manly big time in Thursday night's game against the Roosters. Their playoff dreams now in danger. Roosters 20, Manly 10, full time here on the peninsula. Seven key players were missing, six of them Pacifica, choosing to boycott the game because the pride jersey didn't align with their religious beliefs. Disappointing with everything at the moment, isn't it? No comment. While other Manly players of Christian faith had no issue wearing the jersey. In 2019, Israel Folau was dumped by Australian rugby when he posted on Instagram that hell awaits certain groups of people, including homosexuals. While Rugby Australia accepts the panel's decision directing termination of Israel Folau's playing contract for his high-level breach of the Code of Conduct, we want to stress that this outcome is a painful situation for the game. Rugby Australia did not choose to be in this situation, but Rugby Australia's position remains that Israel, through his actions, left us with no choice but to pursue the course of action resulting in today's outcome. In Pacifica communities, the Christian religion is more than just faith. It touches all aspects of society. Samoan Prime Minister Fiamir Naomi Mata'afa told us during her visit here in June that laws around gay rights won't be changing anytime soon. Do you think there might be a time when same-sex marriage might be allowed in Samoa? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to happen soon. The NRL's ham-fisted rollout of pride jerseys in the name of inclusivity proved to be anything but. The question remains, what now for rainbow players at the pinnacle of men's sport? Hikurangi Kimiota Jackson speaks with former Manly coach Sir Graham Lowe. Sir Graham Lowe is regarded as the greatest rugby league coach that Aotearoa has ever produced. He is the only non-Australian to coach a state of origin team, winning with Queensland in 1991. The former Otahuhu head coach would have success with Wigan in England. His next move would be with the Manly Sea Eagles, where he coached many Kiwi players and a young physical player called Ian Roberts. From Roberts. Crunch! And he screams at him to get up and play it. In 1995, Ian would make a public announcement that he was gay, becoming the first high-profile Australian athlete and the first male rugby player in the world from the rainbow community. What were the challenges for you coaching Ian Roberts at the time, knowing that he was gay but not openly? Yeah, well, you know, I coached Ian right from when he was an 18-year-old, I think 18, might have been 19, and I knew very early that he was gay, um, but there's, there, there was no challenges. Mm. There were no challenges whatsoever. And, I mean, he, it, it was quite obvious for all to see, really, mm. Ian's, Ian's way. Um, but that didn't bring any challenge whatsoever because I respected him as a player, he respected me as a coach, all I was looking for, for was for him to perform and, and really give me 13 Ian Roberts on the field any day whatsoever and I'd coach them the rest of my life. So you used to be the manly coach. What are your thoughts of, on what's played out in the past week? I, I, I think it's been really sad and badly handled. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, th there was obviously when the idea came up to, to wear this jersey and, and help promote um, the whole, you know, that whole situation, um, the inclusiveness and whatnot. There was probably a lot of enthusiasm, but everything happened too qu too quickly. They forgot to, I think it seems they forgot to, to um, engage the most important people of the whole lot, which were the players to start with, and, and that probably started it off. So I think it's poorly handled in some ways by Manly, and then Manly found themselves in a totally no-win situation. How would you have reacted in that whole situation? 
to tell her, to tell the truth, I would have been a little bit disappointed with those players. I totally respect everyone's religion, um, but I don't think religion should play a part in sport at all. But for some of those boys, faithful to, is their identity, it means everything to them. So that's what they would say. I, I, I yeah. understand that. I, yeah. I understand that fully, and I, I respect them for for it as well. Um, but I also have a lot of uh, I have a lot of support and sadness for many young people who are not. Who, who, who may think you know they might be gay, or or, or they're not. There's a, there'll be a lot of confusion with a lot of those young people now, and for whatever message we're supposed to get across, it's all got muddled. And I and I think the losers in all this are the young people, who really are struggling to understand their own identity. What does this do for team morale, um, for Manly? I've been involved with rugby league for you know 60 years. And all, through all that time, there's always been some were Christian and some weren't. I've never, ever had an issue whatsoever. And I just wonder if these seven boys that, that uh, took, the, took the stance that they took, and, and, you know, that in itself takes a lot of courage, but I just wonder if they would have played alongside a man like Ian Roberts, who did have the courage and is the only one that's come out and said he was gay. I wonder if they would have played a game of football alongside Ian Roberts because you couldn't play alongside a better man, a better principled man. It just happens to be Ian's gay. So you don't have a choice of whether you're gay or not. You either are or not. But you have a choice of whether you can bring religion into the thought. And it's the religious side that's, that's got me, you know, it's, I, I, just, I just think it's been used very, very poorly. Is it possible to be inclusive of everyone? It's not impossible at all yeah. because... The language of sport, to me, is the most special language in the world because the language of sport has the strength and the ability and the connection to get countries who are at war with one another to stop for a moment and play a game of soccer or tennis or something else, but just buy that language of sport and then go back to what they were doing. So that language of sport can be used in a, in a, to great advantage with so it's inclusive of everyone mm. and how everyone thinks. What would be your message to those seven players that decided not to play? I feel a little bit sorry for them really and I think that while they're together they'll be, you know, they'll feel pretty strong together but there'll be times when they're on their own um, and, and doubt will come into, into their actions whether they should, you know, they've got to be strong, um, they need to be able to cope with with the comments they're going to get. So they, they, they just have to be strong and they've also got to be understanding. They expected everybody to understand their view when they took their action. Well, now the shoe's on the other foot. But they're not, they're not they shouldn't be penalised. They made their decision. Uh, that, that it, it took strength on their part to make that decision. And I think that also um, time is a great healer of wounds. In some ways, I know this sounds very contradictory, but in some ways, it's only a small thing that happened, but in other ways, it's a massive thing that happened. You know, it's, um, we've got to keep it in its perspective. Sir Graham Lowe referenced legendary Manly star Ian Roberts when giving context to the Pride jersey controversy. After the break, we hear from the man himself. Welcome back. Now, in 1995, Ian Roberts became the first high-profile Australian sportsperson and rugby league player to come out to the public as gay. He had a reputation for being one of the toughest footy players. So what does Ian Roberts make of it all? Ian Roberts, one of the toughest players from the NRL. He's played for three NRL clubs and has represented both New South Wales and Australia. In 1995, in his final season with the Manly Sea Eagles, Ian made it public that he was gay. He's been an icon for the rainbow community ever since. He's the director of Qtopia Sydney and is a patron of Pride in Sport. Ian is also an actor, featuring in films and TV series, including Mr. In Between and Superman Returns. He's also been a runner-up in Dancing with the Stars. It's been a big week for rugby league. Yeah, just your reflections on the week that was. 
Hiku, I would say it's only been a positive, mate. I think it's it's, it's been a, a much needed um, conversation um, around this space, around the uh, the idea of having uh, pride inclusion rounds, and I, and I think now people really understand the um, the meaning and, and the benefit of, of what a pride round actually represents. I think we can all agree it doesn't matter who you love, but it matters that you're loved. And that's basically the fundamental of what a pride round is. So that pride jersey, what kind of impact would it have had on you, a young Ian Roberts, when you were playing footy back in the 80s and the 90s? I mean, I get a little emotional even hearing you say that, but I, um, you know what, I hadn't given it that perspective. You know, I hadn't, I'd known since I, was a, uh, since I was a young man, before my teens, that, that, that I was same-sex attracted. I didn't know what that meant at that time, but I did know it was, I was different, and, and I did know that it was not the way to be. It wasn't accepted. Um, you know, I, I never felt safe enough uh, growing up through my teens. I lived a, quite a, a closeted life, um, you know, in my mid-20s, that I felt safe enough to come out. It was such a different era back then. It was such a different uh, understanding of, of what it was to be, to be you know, LGBTIQA+, plus, uh, you know, back then. Um, such a misunderstanding. And... and um, Oh, I can only imagine it would have been the most incredibly empowering. I mean, you know, it empowers young people. It makes people, you know, um, those, not just young people, anyone dealing with any sort of like sexual identity or um, sexuality issues, it, it makes them feel like they are welcome, that, that they are wanted and that, that, that they are worthy you know, you know, mm -hmm. and included. But, you know, we are all part of the same community, mate. But I can only imagine, wow, having a pride round back in the 80s. My God, I don't know. <laughs> I can only imagine the controversy that that I like, and, and I can only imagine it, um, that what reaction that would have provoked. It would have been, you know, I, I've got to be honest. I thinking back because that was quite a violent time. You know, you're now talking a time in the late eighties when there was a whole load of gay murders, of gay men being thrown off cliffs and that around the um, around the eastern suburbs, and it was a real, it was a really dangerous time. You know, you're, we're now talking. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a different era. I, like, I hadn't given it that perspective. Like, no. you're just giving me that question. I hadn't thought about it like that. Wow. There's actually news out there that there is a manly player that is gay that has been devastated by the news that no longer feels comfortable about his being open about his sexuality. How tough is that? You know, me being gay was like the worst kept secret in rugby league for, for such a long time. And I, but, but I will say, I, before I came out, I had this reluctance to come out because I didn't, because I was leading a gay life anyway. I mean, I, you know, some of the stories, the, the mascot who used to be uh, at, at, at Manly, the, the big sea eagle guy running around in the suit, that was my boyfriend and everyone knew that. That was before I came out. Like, it, I didn't feel like I needed, I felt like it was almost like this political decision. Why do I have to come out mm. to be accepted? It was almost like, but I, 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 looking back now, that was also a bit of stubbornness and just seeing, I, I was just kind of what, de demanding equal, equal rights without out having to declare anything, basically. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I understand the importance of visibility now and how that affects other people and how, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it and how that affects young people. They, they need to see their, they need to see themselves up there. They need representation. I, I do think um, with the overwhelmingly positive response that the, that the Pride Rouse had now, you know, that, that player at Manly, if there is that player at Manly, I would feel he, he would feel a bit empowered, but he's still, you know, He's, you know, he's going to have to have that conversation with, with those players who, who uh, sat the game out. You know, and I, and I think on reflection, I think even those players, it's been a bit enlightening for them too. You know, mm -hmm. educational uh, um, that most people get now. You're like, you know, it's, you know, it's okay to love someone. Yeah, I was, I was watching the news and you said you wanted to sit down with those seven players and have a court at all. I totally respect um, th th those men and, and their choices. You know, um, I, I think like I look back and I, 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 I often thought, what what does the LGBTIQA plus community need to do to, to be respected? Because a lot of times they're just disrespected because you know I get disrespected just because I'm gay. For no fault of my own, people think that's enough. That that's enough to be di di disrespectful to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I often wonder what is it we have to do to. <laughs> <laughs> like just to bridge that gap, just to, and you know, like, and I've I've kind of found it's like in all in my conversations, I've always had to be concessional. I've always had to make compromises. I've always I've always had to take 
the back of the seat and listen, I, I get, um, you know, I, uh, but, but I mean, I'm, that's okay. I would love to be able to sit down and talk to those guys, to, to, to those guys if they wanted to. I'm not, I'm not saying they want to talk to me. And I, I'd understand if they didn't. I, I, you know, um, I don't have any sort of qualifications or any sort of professional uh, um, uh, certificates in, in this field. You know, I'm not an expert. I've just been placed in this situation because of my own personal situation coming out. And to give a voice, you know, I do feel like I need to give a voice to all the to, to the voiceless out there, all those young kids that are home who are dealing with their sexuality and issues. You know, like sometimes they don't have a voice. They don't have someone to speak up to them. They need to see that visibility. They need to see people in the community who are, who are, it's not about being brave, who are in ownership in themselves saying, yeah, I'm gay. And it's, you know, I love, can I say this? You go, I, I, I think I want to say this, oh, you know, I didn't even think of, I love the, I love being gay. I mean, I'm so glad, I'm so grateful I was born gay because it's it's totally enlightened, not just me, but my family. I grew up in an incredibly homophobic family, incredibly homophobic, but that, but they've all changed. They've all now seen that, that it's okay to love and, and this is not a choice and it's, and it's made them, it's made them richer and made, and made their lives and, and given them more insight in, in, into what it is to care for other people and, and and, and how powerful that is, you know. I, I just want to say that I love the fact that I'm gay. I'm so glad I was born gay. Mm. I want, I, and that's what I would love other like other people, and the kids and, and people dealing with this to, to feel that power and that strength of, of just, yeah. I mean, I I love my partner. I mean, I I can't tell you that this he's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Yeah. So I, I, that, that's that's what I would love to say to those guys. You know, like. Love is love. I mean, it, it sounds like a tacky thing to say, but it's so true, man. Is it lonely? Is it a tiring journey for you being the only open gay man and you're like the go-to person when these kind of issues arise? I will say that um, it, it does sometimes uh, feel like a heavy load, mate. I yeah. I, I can say on, on Thursday morning, um, I did have a bit of a meltdown. I was supposed to do some other publicity. It was just too much, mate. I was just like... <laughs> I got to the point my partner had to cancel those meetings because I was just like, I can't keep up the happy face all the time because yeah. you know, like it, 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 I can't keep up. And that's what I mean about having to compromise. I always feel like I need to be the happy face or need to be the positive. And sometimes it's just like it was devastating to get that news, mate, for, for me. That, um, And I'm not attacking those seven players. I'm not. It's not about that. But it was kind of devastating. And it was just like because I do know the potentially catastrophic consequences for some kids out there in the suburbs you know mm -hmm. you know they, they, the lgbtqa plus um community are 11 times you know i don't want to start quoting all these horrible statistics but 11 times more likely to take their life yeah you know it's it, that type of thing and, the, and and these are these are the consequences of, of potential consequences of boycotts and that of, of, of pride rounds and things like that. people don't realize that there are kids at home feeling like they are less or kids at home feeling like they are somehow alien and that they are worthless and be, because they're gay are we naive to think that there's never been a gay or black or another uh gay man that's played in the nrl i mean it's crazy i mean obviously that's you know that's yeah that's beyond belief that that's actually beyond belief you know it's like but you know, the thing is we obviously don't have a safe space so eh? yeah. yeah well that's exactly right mate you know if someone doesn't feel safe enough to come out then we need there's still work to be done you know like we still need you know and that's not only about the positive about the uh the past week's event this has been a pop because it's a conversation that had to be had a lot of people think particularly here in australia since we had the, the marriage equality vote like four years ago that, that that fight now is now over and that's been dealt with and you know equals equal it's not there's still an incredible amount of homophobia transphobia happens daily like there's an incredible amount of that and it's you know we have to have this conversation that's why i really think it's been a kind of a healthy thing i'm really glad that manly stuck to their guns also and in that they allowed those seven players to stand down but they didn't change the jumper that you know that that manly by doing that manly you know uh, they were basically saying there are some things in you know in some things in rugby league that are more more important than two points. You know, it, 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 we are now talking about the quality and the world being of of of, of our, our supporters and, and our playing group. This is more important than that, and that's why I was so glad that they sucked to the guns and played in that jumper. It was, 
incredibly incredibly powerful. And I just want to thank Desi, all the players, all the administration there, all all the all the staff that work there, and all the supporters for um, uh, f- f- for doing that. There's a lot to unpack here. Sure, it's easy to make accusations of homophobia, to slam players for holding religious beliefs that are out of touch and unevolved. Andre Afamasanga is at the Human Rights Commission and says the reality is far more nuanced than we might think. Because the players are Pacific, is that um, those who identify as rainbow and LGBT and are also Pacific as well. Because what we will now see when we go onto social media the conversations that we'll be having in our families, in our cars, in our churches, and the places we love to congregate is, is that there's going to be this debate. And um, one of the debates will be around uh, absolutely supporting those players. But on the flip side of supporting those players, people are going to feel like they need someone to blame uh, for all the rhetoric that is going to go around. And if you are Rainbow and Pacific, and you belong to those communities, religious, family, or cultural communities, you're going to feel like uh, there's no place for you to belong. You've said it is Pacific communities who suffer the greatest consequences of these sporting and religious cultural expression debates. What do you mean by that? I think that uh, these Pacific young men who have a right to express their religious beliefs, and I absolutely support that, and I'm a human rights worker. What I do get concerned about, though, is that uh, Pacific young men are being the poster boys uh, for something that... That's something that maybe they didn't sign up for. Maybe they were uncomfortable because of their religious beliefs not to wear the jersey. And all of a sudden, I worry that they're going to be co-opted by bigger powers, by um, people that have um, some really firm views about a whole bunch of different issues that they're going to fall into now. And I don't know if that's what they signed up for. Mm. I worry for them because um, mass media and the general public, as they debate this issue, We'll start to talk about, um, you know, Pacific uh, people and about their religion and about their culture in ways that really aren't nuanced, in ways that people don't really understand. So, for instance, people will be criticising the church. And while I absolutely acknowledge that the church and colonisation has done a job on our people in terms of, um, you know, us adopting these uh, Western and colonial ways of thinking that deny our inherent um, identities and who we are, our sexual identities and our gender identities. Um, So while there is all that and that's the role that the church has played in that situation, what we forget is that for many of us, the church has really played a really important part and has been there when other people haven't been able to be there. Well, you once played a very active role in your church and then you stepped down. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. First of all, I'll just say that, um, you know, I grew up in the church. That's what my family did day in, day out, and also on the weekends. And when you grow up in that system, I learned really early on that it was not okay to be gay. I learned that that's what I thought, that that's not what God wanted for you. You know, I read the Bible. There's six Bible verses that they often use. They're called clobber texts that sort of say that God uh, doesn't like or support homosexuality or diverse genders and sexualities. And so that's what I grew up in. So to the point that I eventually became a pastor, but I also spent 15 years in what is called conversion practices or conversion therapy. And these are practices that purport to be able to change your uh, sexuality, your gender. And I put myself right in the middle of all of those. And unfortunately, uh, by the time I got to age 40, I realized that after 15 years of those practices, that I was not possible at all to change my sexuality. But I'd learned that the hard way. I learned that after I started to suffer depression, anxiety, and actually was thinking about taking my life. It was really hard for me because I was a pastor as well. So on one hand, I was experiencing this on my own. And on the other hand, here I was, you know, meant to be sort of like a shepherd and a pastor to people. But I think it just hit that moment where I realized that I can't do this. And not only can I not do this, but actually I don't think it works. So Mm -hmm. at that point, uh, I stopped being a pastor No one told me that I had to resign. I already knew that the church uh, wouldn't support that. And so I left willingly. And since leaving then, I've come to learn about a God and biblical interpretations that are more inclusive, uh, more expansive, that 
have allowed me to accept myself and have to say, more, I've never been happier. Non-Christians have labelled the players who took part in the boycott as hypocrites because they said they, they didn't bother boycotting over sponsorship around gambling and alcohol. What do you think? Is that helpful? Yeah, it's such uh, an interesting question. It's a question that really makes sense to a lot of people outside the church. They're like, oh, aren't these all these things bad? But unfortunately, if you've grown up in the church, you though no one says it, you learn about a sort of a hierarchy of sins. And there are some sins that uh, seem to be a little bit more acceptable than others. Now, some people will say that no sin is acceptable, but I've often found that, um, you know, there's something else going on here, and that's the cultural wars as well. And in these cultural wars, um, sexuality is often a really hot topic. And I think it's uh, uh, an issue that really um, pushes a lot of people's buttons. And so I think that's why people might ignore gambling, they might ignore alcohol, and they might see sexuality as the most um, you know, offensive uh, type sin. And so again, that is the challenge for church leaders uh, to think about why is it that we might ignore these other manner of sins and this one? So I think there's a lot of um, sort of paradoxes that are clear to people outside the church, but if you've grown up in the church, uh, it makes a lot of sense. You said it's time we unite as a wider community to have an internal family conversation. What kind of conversation needs to happen? I would say religious leaders, community leaders, don't you recognise that um, that we are being co-opted uh, for a conversation that we didn't start and that's much bigger than us? You know, I sincerely think about those players at the moment and I think not only of them, but I think of their families when they start to read, you know, all the public, um, you know, um, conversation that's going to go on about them. And I feel like that's going to have a wear and tear on them. I think about their finances. I think about their wallet as well. And it just seems sad to me that we have been caught up in this situation um, when I kind of feel like that's, that's someone else's battle. The other thing I would also say to um, us is in terms of having this whānau conversation is, is that um, these debates always uh, end up with rainbow people being the casualty. And so every time we go into this debate, before long, people are going to turn on us, our own family members, our own churches, our own friendships, friends sometimes, and they're going to blame us for it. And I'm, I want to say to religious leaders, is that right that that happens? Don't we have, like, uh, you know, cultural values and even religious values that might make us think that we need to protect, you know, and we need to uffy people and we need to bring them in rather than deciding um, that all of a sudden we don't belong uh, when it comes to a sporting issue, a sporting debate, you know, we're bigger than sports, you know, we're bigger than political debate, you know, and I, that's the type of conversation I want us to have. Now, a shout out to all those advocates from the Rainbow community actively making a difference here in Aotearoa and Australia. Thank you for watching tonight. We look forward to your feedback online through our Facebook page, Twitter and Insta. Pō marie.